Well, thank you, Sarah, very much, and thank you to ODI for hosting it. I'm just about to turn the floor over to Martin, who's going to give some introductory uh, thoughts. But uh, first, I must say thank you to everybody who, even though the books were a little late, bought so many of them. And congratulations to Martin, who, despite his eye problems, signed lots of them. Um, if it's pretty illegible, forgive him. Um, I'm still trying to work out whether he really thinks Mark is, but anyway. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, I mean, for me, the most important thing tonight is that Martin was one of my first bosses in the UN. We shared a house together in Bangkok. So for me, this is a journey down a wonderful memory lane with a colleague who remained friend and, and colleague for all the decades thereafter. So Martin, I'm not going to be a very tough questioner. I fear <laughs> the word debate is probably completely the wrong one. Uh, but the floor is yours for your first thoughts. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and thank you to ODI for, for hosting the event. Um, this is a rather extraordinary moment for me, as I'm sure you will imagine. Uh, thank you also to my publisher, IB Taurus. And thank you to all of you for coming. Uh, thanks particularly to, to Mark, who not only has come and said these nice things, but has, as you, I hope, will see, written a very kind foreword. And as he says, has been a friend uh, since we first met in, in Thailand. Um, I should say that the title of the book uh, has nothing to do with my eyesight. Um, <laughs> It's to do with what I believe happens to many of us when we're confronted with the consequences of particularly of conflict and the humanitarian emergencies that result from conflict. I want to say too that the origins of this book come from a, um, an opportunity that I was given by uh, Professor Roland Danreuter, and I'm not sure if he's here, uh, but um, he is? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Roland. <laughs> and uh, Roland gave me the chance to give a course in Edinburgh um, 2006 uh, on the United Nations and complex emergencies. And a number of the students came up to me during the course and said, well, your reading list is very interesting. But uh, rather, as Sarah was saying, there are quite a few analyses and there are some uh, accounts of particular, um, uh, particular events, but there's very little about what it's actually like to do it, to be uh, an official uh, running a humanitarian program. And so I looked around, and indeed, there was very little. So I rather rashly said to the students, well, I'll, maybe I should write it. So finally, seven years later, or thereabouts, um, the result is, uh, is here. Um, as Sarah said, the, the book starts in Laos, continues Thailand, back to London, uh, Afghanistan, Bosnia, New York, and finishes in Abu Dhabi. And it covers uh, work on refugees, internally displaced persons, asylum seekers, coordination of humanitarian aid, um, peacekeeping, and the landmine problem, uh, the sector which is now known as mine action. I thought it might be uh, useful to give you an idea of two or three of the th themes which I've tried to insert in the narrative. And the first, perhaps, is that being able to work in the United Nations in humanitarian operations in response to crisis is an enormous privilege and one that leads to, to great humility. Uh, occasionally, one meets people who 
don't show perhaps as much humility. And it, occasionally one feels that in oneself one is not showing as much humility as one should. But it is a career that inspires um, humility uh, and it is a privilege to, to have had it. The second theme is that, in my view, good intentions are not enough. Mark may remember that in 1980, uh, when we were working on the, uh, well, in Thailand with the refugees coming across from Cambodia after the genocide, um, I received a visit uh, in my office in Bangkok from the director of a very large international NGO. And he said to me, Martin, I've got wonderful news for you. I'm going to send three fully equipped medical teams. So I said, uh, well, that's very good, but um, can I make a small request? And that is that in place of two of the medical teams, you send sanitation teams, because actually we've got rather a lot of doctors. And we wouldn't need so many if everybody wasn't catching diarrhea because of poor sanitation. So he wasn't terribly um, happy about that. <laughs> and he said, OK, well, look, I'll try and send one. Uh, so we agreed that he would send one sanitation team and two medical teams. Two or three days later, I get a call from him from his headquarters saying, you know, the good news is that I found a sanitation team, a really good sanitation team. The bad news is that I haven't persuaded any of my donors to pay for it. And so at, we at UNHCR had to find the money to pay for the sanitation team. And the sanitation team, of course, was worth far more than the medical teams. But because people are blinded by their sense of what is needed in a humanitarian emergency, none of his donors was willing to change their, their gift from a medical team to a sanitation team. Now, that was 35 years ago, but I'm sorry to say that it's still happening. Um, in spite of all our efforts to explain to people what, what the priorities are. The third um, theme or message that, that I hope runs through the book is that although the UN is a very complicated uh, and sometimes difficult organization to work for, uh, reform is possible. And um, Mark will certainly remember that in 2003, a very energetic Norwegian called Jan Egeland came to take over as emergency relief coordinator, who is the official responsible for coordinating all well, the response to all humanitarian emergencies. And he said, well, this is great that I've got this job, but where's the money? How do I, how do I respond to a, an immediate crisis if I don't have a pot of money? So he, and undoubtedly with, with Mark and, and uh, Kofi Annan's support, um, engaged with a number of um, ministers from donor governments in particular, especially actually Hillary Benn, um, who was then the Secretary of State at uh, DFID, uh, Department for International Development. And they persuaded the General Assembly at the end of 2005 to create a new fund called the Central Emergency Response Fund. And since that time, that fund has been uh, resourced with $450 million a year and has transformed the way the UN is able to respond to humanitarian emergencies. Uh, there are two or three other examples of similar changes in the book that can be made within the UN system um, when the right people work together uh, to make them happen and they make a difference. The last chapter of the book has the title Blinded by Humanity. And in it, I've identified seven 
issues which I have called blind spots. One or two people have pointed out that some of them are not really blind spots. But um, anyway, I think it's a, a reasonable term for it. And I thought I'd just very quickly introduce a couple of them so that you get the flavour of it. And the first is what I call the brain drain. And what happens goes something like this. I'm appointed to be the head of a new UN agency office or a new international NGO office in country X, maybe in Africa or Asia. And I go along full of enthusiasm and uh, talk to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and they say, yes, we, we, we'd like you to provide your programme. So I look around and see where I can find really well-qualified local uh, nationals to work with me to deliver this programme. And I find one or two maybe in the government or in local government. So I approach them and ask them if they wouldn't like to come and work for the UN or for the NGO. And so they tend to ask, what is the salary? So I say, oh, it's probably about four or five times what you're currently earning. Would that be enough? So many of them say, oh, that would be great. Thank you very much. So the, the best people from the government, or many of them, then come and work for international organisations, embassies, NGOs. A few years later, we look around and say, well, we'd really like to hand over this project to the government. <laughs> Wait a minute, why is the government so incompetent? Uh, why is the government apparently rather corrupt? And, um, well, this is one of the ways in which I think we are rather blind to the reality that is in front of us. Um, the UN, the international NGOs, uh, very often poach the best staff from governments and then wonder why they can't hand the projects over to the government. The second example that I'd like to uh, give you starts in Afghanistan, 1989-1990, um, just after the uh, Soviet withdrawal, and I was working for the UN Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Assistance to Afghanistan, and we realised that one of the big problems was going to be landmines, that many of the areas to which refugees would be returning were infested with anti-personnel landmines. So we looked around to see whether there was a UN agency which had ever done this kind of work before, and, and there wasn't. It had never been done by the UN before. We looked around to see if there were any international NGOs who'd ever done it, and there weren't, although there were a couple just being established. And so we thought, well, how are we going to do this? And um, my then boss, uh, Zia Rizvi, said, let's establish some Afghan NGOs. So we identified five highly recommended Afghans and said, would you like to be the director of a new NGO to work on the landmine problem? And they said yes. Within three, four years, there were 8,000 Afghans working on mine clearance and mine awareness, as it was then called, for those five Afghan NGOs funded by the UN. And they remain the core of the effort to remove landmines in Afghanistan. Um, has this happened in Cambodia or Mozambique or Angola? Well, not really. Uh, why? Because by the time the UN got to Cambodia, there were international NGOs offering to do the work for the UN or for other international donors. And so the donors said, oh, um, maybe we should put our money through this international NGO or that international NGO. Uh, 
And so now, when you look around and you see who's working at senior levels in the international mine action world, you find Brits, Australians, New Zealanders, South Africans, and Afghans. Yes, Afghans. Why? Because Afghans were given ownership, <laughs> leadership, uh, direction, roles from the start in the management of mine action operations in their own country. Um, and unfortunately, our default response to a new requirement in any country tends, in my view, too often to be let's send in an international NGO to do it, rather than let's see whether we can encourage uh, the Afghans or the Mozambicans or the Cambodians to establish organizations which can do it themselves, and then we have to support them. Now, it's not all that simple. We gave a lot of constant support to these Afghan NGOs. But they worked with us to establish the standard operating procedures, uh, the policies, the standards, the pay scales, the audit processes. And they were audited by the UN auditors, by the European Commission auditors, uh, by Price Waterhouse. And I have to tell you that their audit reports were actually slightly better than ours were in the UN. Um, so with the right support uh, and with the right guidance and assistance, local organizations can do anything. Last um, point, December 2011, I had the great good fortune to be part of a delegation of the United Arab Emirates in Busan, South Korea, at the fourth high-level forum on aid effectiveness. <coughs> 3,000 people attended. Some people said, gosh, that was boring, wasn't it? And I said, well, no, actually, I didn't think it was. And for one particular reason, and that is that we arrived talking about aid effectiveness, and we left talking about development effectiveness. So this whole machinery of the OECD and UNDP no longer talks about aid effectiveness, it talks about development effectiveness. Now why is that important? Because if you think about it, talking about aid effectiveness, we're looking at things from our perspective as aid donors. We want to know whether our aid has been effective. But that's not really the question we should be asking. The question we should be asking is, is the country that we are supporting, is its development taking place? So we need to shift the perspective, shift the perspective from our point of view to their point of view. So I hope that in 2016, when the World Humanitarian Summit takes place, there might be a similar shift in focus in the humanitarian world from a very heavily donor-dominated perspective to a perspective based in the countries that are receiving humanitarian assistance. Martin, thank you. There's one editorial footnote I should say is that that NGO that came to see you and you sent them away saying come back with a public health team yes. is the International Rescue Committee, yeah. <laughs> uh, now headed by David Miliband. That's so right. we right. hope that the flea is still in his ear <laughs> uh, and that he, is, uh, that he has heard that. Yeah. But Martin, I want to take you back to the beginning because I, I have a theory that it's our early international experiences, or in some case, experiences even before that, which sort of shape us in terms of intellectual direction on these issues. And to the extent I'm going to ask you a hard question tonight, you know what's coming. It's around uh, 
at this issue of refugee resettlement in the US after the Indochina conflict, as you described so eloquently, and you know, it's as though it was just yesterday for you, those years you spent in Laos as a teacher uh, for VSO, and then as, as, as a social scientist, you know, left you with this deeply embedded love of this quiet, idyllic country, which was then so brutally disrupted by the war, uh, the Viet Vietnam War and the sort of, sort of spilling over of that war in, in, into Laos. And you had to watch and, and hear the results of, of, of American bombing of, of hill tribes and other Laotian communities. You know, fast forward to when we were friends and colleagues and, and housemates, you were struggling with this issue of a new generation of Americans coming apparently in supplication to say, you know, whatever happened in the past, these refugees have been so, they worked for the American administration in the different countries of Indochina, the only solution for them is resettlement in the US or in Australia or Canada or Europe. Yeah. It's the only place their human rights will be protected. And you were one of those who actually said, well, hold on a moment, um, you know, these are the people who will be needed to rebuild these countries. And, you know, hence shaped up one of the great debates of that period. Um, you know, should these people, even if they sided with the Americans, um, be given asylum? Or would it be much better for the healing and rebuilding of their countries that they went back? And I always felt that for you, and, and we've talked about this before, so I'm not surprising yeah. you by saying this, that you looked at it through the emotional prism of this is the country that destroyed the idol that was Laos. And in that sense, there was an anger on your part towards, you know, America and its role in the, even this refugee operation. And, you know, for me, in a way, it actually drives the headline. Because if ever there's a blinded by humanity case, it's, you know, did we, the West, deal with that extraordinary human talent who spilled out of Indochina correctly? Were we right to resettle them? Or should we have fought for a reconciliation that would have allowed them to go home? Well, you're right that, that this is the one of the, of the great dilemmas that I have uh, approached during my career. And I have to say that it's very topical uh, because there are very similar things happening uh, in another part of the world right now. Um, at the time, my um, take on it was that, um, that we should apply the, the principles of international refugee law, which were that if the key concept of which is that if somebody has a well-founded fear of persecution in their country of origin, they cannot be forced to go back. They cannot be forced to go back. And that, it seems to me, means two things which we were not able to get across to the Americans or indeed to the governments of uh, the countries to which these people initially fled. And w one of those r relates to the countries to which they initially fled was that they had no right under international law to force these people to go back. And the second was that the United States and other Western donors uh, could not simply assume that every single person who left Indochina was a bona fide refugee. And I tell a story uh, in the book which I think illustrates 
the, this particular, the crux of this dilemma. In 1976, I was working in Laos for UNHCR with internally displaced persons. And from time to time, people would come into my office and close the door and say, Martin, can we talk privately? And in those days, there weren't quite so many bugging devices, <laughs> so, it was, so it was right. And so um, they would say, um, I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow. So I'd say, oh, that's interesting. Can I come and see you off at the airport? No, 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 no. I'm, going to I'm going to cross the river. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to France. So I'd say, well, wait a minute. How are you going to get to France by crossing the river? Oh, well, um, no, I will go you know, across the river, and then I'll, I'll become a refugee, and then I'll go to France. So I would always ask them, if you knew that you couldn't go to France and that you have to stay in Thailand, would you be leaving? And it, it used to take sometimes five or ten minutes to get the, to get the idea across into their heads because it wasn't in anybody's head. Nobody was leaving in order to seek sanctuary in Thailand. Everybody was leaving in order to go to France or the United States or Australia. And the dozen or so people that I interviewed uh, under those circumstances all said to me, well, of course not. I wouldn't be leaving if I had to stay in Thailand. And I know that there were, of course, others who had been working for the Americans uh, who had senior positions in the Royal Lao government uh, and equivalent people in Vietnam uh, who, of course, left because they feared persecution and because they would simply not have had uh, a reasonable livelihood in those countries after that event. But the vast majority of the people who left Laos and Vietnam at that time did not do so really because they feared persecution and in my view could not be considered as refugees under the convention and that was that was my problem with the american policy no well, well thanks for that i mean it's it, it's clear and but of course that distinction between a refugee and an economic migrant you know as i mean the debates alive like so much else in humanitarianism yeah. all these years later yeah. I mean, you just have to look at what's going on in this country, and yeah. you know, still nobody's settled yeah. um, on, on on these differences in a in a very powerful way. I mean, I in that sense, Martin. I mean, to fast forward from the beginning to the end, in a sense yeah. of this extraordinary career you describe in the book. I mean, are you surprised how much the agenda at the end is the same as it was at the beginning? <laughs> That's a very good, uh, frankly, and, and I hesitate to say this in the presence of UNHCR's newly arrived representative in London, <coughs> but <laughs> it has been my view for some time um, that international refugee law is not fit for purpose. Uh, and that it doesn't make sense. Um, not that the 1951 convention, for those of you who are familiar with this, didn't make sense because it's expired, essentially. But the 1967 protocol, which universalizes refugee law, and which means that, and I tend to use this example, that if somebody in Papua New Guinea is in fear of persecution and makes his or her way relatively expeditiously to Venezuela and seeks refugee status in Venezuela, the government of Venezuela is obliged to consider their case and if it's valid, accept them to live in Venezuela. In my view, this doesn't make any sense. Um, the African Union has its own refugee convention that makes sense. Um, 
the principle of non-refoulement, which is the key conceptual idea in refugee law, is absolutely essential. It cannot be uh, done away with under any circumstances. So if somebody is in this country and circumstances change in their home country, which may make it impossible for them to go back, then of course we cannot ask them to leave. But if, if the country in which people are suffering is on the other side of the world and there are neighbouring countries which are parties to refugee conventions, as was the case for, as is the case for Afghans travelling to Pakistan and Iran, then personally, if Afghans are making their way at enormous cost, an enormous risk through many countries and ending up in Calais and coming across um, that way, I, I wouldn't um, uh, examine their cases. I would uh, ask them to return to Pakistan and Iran. And I think if, if, if we were to reform refugee law along those lines, and if we were to accept people on the basis of particular needs rather than on the fact that they have spent a lot of money, risked their lives, maybe risked drowning in the Mediterranean, um, we would have a better system. But this is not a popular view. And um, on, on other parts of the, of the UN system, yes, I think the a very brief answer. Um, I see it becoming increasingly complex, um, increasingly fragmented, the number of organisations that are involved. And, um, well, uh, perhaps if we sort of took a blank piece of paper and started again, we'd come up with something a little more workable. Yeah, we might, although I think the same forces which would in, be intent on undermining it would still be there. Well, right? that's probably right. Uh, yes. um, but the, 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 just one more question, and then be aware, people, friends, I'm going to turn to you, the audience, on this. I, I, um, you, you finished up. Um, your last big job was in that most unlikely place, the UAE, um, helping them work out how much money they were spending on development. Um, because they'd never reported it, you know, they'd been used to being shamed every year by OECD for apparently not spending a lot of money. And I think you actually found they're spending quite a lot, in fact, but it's through all kinds of different accounts. But how long before those new donors really take their seat at the top table and start to sort of shape the development and humanitarian discussion? Oh, how long have we got? <laughs> um, this is a very tricky question, but to try and answer it as briefly as I possibly can. Um, I think that a number of people in those countries um, see the, the pathway to reaching that the goal you just described. But for the people who see the pathway, it's actually quite difficult to make it happen because they have to engage other people in their communities, other people, perhaps more senior people, and they have to explain to them what, if you like, the rules of the game are uh, for joining this particular club. And I suppose the question which they sometimes ask is, well, if we join that club, will we simply get absorbed by it? Or will we be in a position to, to shape the way it develops? And if they felt that they were in a position 
really to shape the way it develops a bit, to help shape the way it develops, I think they might be more encouraged to, to, to seek membership of the club. Good. Well, look, with that, I mean, I'm going to make one observation and then I'm turning to you all, so I'm, I've got a few people who I anticipate will have questions uh, in a moment. But, you know, I do think just one sort of observation on what Martin said. I mean, if you think about it, when states started to do social policy, the first thing they did was humanitarian work. Long before there was a fully developed education or healthcare system, you had some kind of basic social safety net which would help the really destitute. Uh, and you would imagine if this global community of which we are part was getting its act together at all, by now we would have a humanitarian order which was a bit more than just the charitable drives of Martin's IRC New York doctors and their donors, and which would in a sensible way say we need health, we need public health workers and sanitation experts, and where all countries would feel an obligation to contribute. And yet, and, and maybe we feel a bit of that with Ebola because of the sense to which it is at least at the margins of communicable disease that we all have to collectively do something about that. We will have, as we came here by tube tonight, seen that Ebola ad from the Disasters Emergency Committee help stop it spreading or whatever it says. And, you know, and that, but that's really the core of humanitarianism, that you know, it's a global responsibility of all of us to help the most destitute and weak when other systems of support fail them. And it is extraordinary that, you know, after a career like Martin's and many others of us in this room, we still are a million miles away from embracing that as a global social responsibility. It, it's still a network of philanthropists, yeah. half good governments, and an awful lot of us who volunteered time, particularly uh, in our 20s and 30s to work on these kinds of programs. Yeah. But with that, let's open the floor.